Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this debate featuring the candidates for City Council in the 44th District, Alan Yeager, Rudy Heiken, and Ashi Tishler. My name is Nachman Blasko. I am the administrator of this Miss Yaakov, and we are pleased to host this debate. Siakov Borough Park is a true community-owned and run school, and therefore we are honored to open our doors to this community event. I would, <laughs> I would like to thank Ms. Ruth Lichtenstein, the Hamadiyya publisher, and the entire staff of Hamadiyya and Hamadiyya.com for staging this important event. Baruch Hashem, we live in a democracy in which one of our most basic and cherished rights are that we the people get to vote for our elected officials. But with that right comes a responsibility. Elections have consequences. So before every election, we must familiarize ourselves with the issues and with each candidate's stand on each issue so that when voting the representatives, we make the best possible choice. This is an important position that these candidates are running for. It is very important to both our community and to its moistest atar. We therefore wish the ultimate winner much hatzlocha. We are confident that during the next hour and a half or so, you will learn everything you need to know about the candidates so that you can make an informed decision when voting on November 7th. Thanks to all for your participating, and I will now turn the floor, floor, floor over to Rabbi Eichen and Dunn, a Medea's political news editor who will be moderating this afternoon's event. Thank you, Rabbi Blasfalk, for your warm introduction. And thank you, Ms. Yaakov Abarfak, for allowing us to use this venue today. My name is Yerchan and Dunn, the political editor at Hamidia newspaper. In the name of Mr. Lichtenstein, the publisher, and the Ahmadi editorial staff, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Members of the community, elected officials, dignitaries, and the police department. A particular mention, I want to note the presence of Councilman David Greenfield and Councilman Chaim Deutsch. I will be moderating today's debate. With me are our three panelists, Barry Spitzer, Yosef Rappaport, and Josh Melvin. First, let me introduce the three candidates who are running in the New York City Council for the 44th District. Kalman Yeager, who is running on the Democratic and Conservative lines. <laughs> Yoni Heiken, who is running on the Alabama. Who's running on the school choice party line? <laughs> the institution of the political debate has its origins in the ancient Greeks and to the 1800s in the United States. Yet it is a modern invention. Since the 1970s, debates have been illuminating for voters and allow the candidates to familiarize themselves with the needs of their potential constituents. Hamadiya set the goal for today's debate. Educated voters pay attention to what the government does. We would like to keep this debate clear and informative. We ask our candidates to give us true, straight answers on the issues and stay away from the platitudes of the campaign trail. In addition, let's all remember, here at today's debate, we are sure you will do your best to help us turn it into an event of Kedush Hashem. Let's remember that the younger generation is looking up to us. And let's give them a positive memory of campaign 2017. To the audience, we appreciate you coming and sharing these important moments in our communities. As a show of respect to the event, please, we ask that there be no applause or heckling. We also ask that all cell phones be turned off now. The rules of today's debate were set in advance. The candidate seating arrangements and the order of who speaks was decided by the Yoruba papers by someone unaffiliated with any campaign. According to the Yoruba's results, Mr. Yeager is seated on the right. I will get to answer first at the first question. 
Mr. Heiken will be in the center, I will answer second. And Mr. Tishner will be on left, I will answer third. For the second question, Mr. Heiken will get to answer first, followed by Mr. Tischler and Mr. Yeager. For the third question, Mr. Tischler, Mr. Tischler will answer first, followed by Mr. Yeager and Mr. Heiken. The order for the fourth question then reverts as to as it was for the first question. Candidates get 90 seconds to respond to each question with a 30 second rebuttal if anyone mentions or attacks another candidate by name. There is a countdown clock as well as the bell that will ring when the time slide is up. The bell sounds like this and will be audible to the candidates. We will begin the debate with an opening statement of two minutes per candidate. They will be able to introduce themselves to the voters and lay out their platforms. This will be followed by 10 questions and will conclude with a one minute closing statement per candidate. After the debate, members of the audience will get time to ask the questions to the candidates. The questions will come from the cards that you filled out earlier. Now, for the opening statement, let us begin. Thank you very much. We're going to try to fix that a little bit. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, my great appreciation to the South of the Bar Park for opening your home to us, and uh, to the Hamadiyya for sponsoring this wonderful debate. My name is Kalman Yeager, and I'm just adjusting my mic. There we go. Uh, I've served my community for my entire life. I began when I was a teenager, at age 19, uh, serving as an aide to a local council member. That was 24 years ago. And after doing that for two years, I worked for a borough president for six years. I worked for a major nonprofit organization for two years. And 10 years after I graduated college, I went back to school to earn my law degree. I spent my entire life in public service, and for the last 17 years, I've served on the community board, representing most of, or part of this district, uh, representing our community's interests, whether it's on zoning issues and helping to build and helping even expand their homes and helping schools expand to larger sizes than they are today, helping address our community's needs with regard to traffic issues, with regard to transportation, with regard to parking, with regard to our parks. It's something I've done, no paycheck, but something I've done because I love doing it. I'm running this race because our community has a choice to make over the next nine days, and on the ninth day we're going to choose. What is the future of our nation? Our neighborhood has been served for the last eight years by Councilman David Mason. People may think you've done a good job. I do. People may think you haven't done a good job, and that's your choice. But I'm running to continue to do this. I think you've done a very good job in revitalizing our parks. Fourteen parks have received a revitalization over the last eight years. Fourteen in our community. Tens of millions of dollars have been brought into our community to fund unlicensed, to fund our institutions, to fund our nonprofits, to fund our civic associations. And in, in historic history, several years ago, two years ago, we were able to get past an historic bill in the New York City Council that people said will never get done. And that was to provide for safety officers in our region. That's a bill that I helped about back in fourth year, and the council gave the bridge of leadership and got 46 post conferences to pass that in the federal way. That's the work I want to continue, and that's the thing that goes. At its best. This is our community, uh, so many from Borough Park and from Columbia Bay, coming together to listen, to listen to what the candidates want to share with you, to listen to what the candidates want to give over to you about themselves, to listen to what the candidates want to portray to you and give you a sense of their vision of what the next four years will hold. I take this as serious as you could imagine. And I see in the seriousness of the faces here that so do you. I repeat, I take this as serious as you can imagine. To me, the next four years of this community, and very likely for over the eight years, will depend on what happens over the next nine days. And to me, to be in this opportunity, to have this chance, to talk to everyone here, to continue talking to people like I have on the streets for the past two months is something that I cannot, I cannot express enough how important that is to me, 
how amazing that is to me, and how humbled I am by even the opportunity to be that choice over the next four years. To conclude, like I started, and why this is so serious to me, is because all I've known my whole life, yes, it is my experience, and there's two parts to, I believe, what you would want or what an elected official should be. Know-how and character. And my experience plays the both. There's only one thing I've ever known, and that is being there for people, figuring out how to help people. And I know that the next four years, if God willing, I am the candidate, how much I will be there for everyone here and the entire community. Mr. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Hamadiyya, for inviting me to this debate. And thank you for the coming out in this uh, main event. My name is Heshi Tishla. I don't wear a suit. I was told I have to, so I put it on for you guys. I've lived in this community for 40 something years. I grew up in this community. I've raised my children in this community. I've raised other children who come through my house in this community. I've served thousands of meals of my fish and six eggs, the board of Sheriff's Island. We've served thousands of meals every single month. My house is an open house, not just to my children and their friends, but anybody who wants to come on the job. Anybody who wants to come during the week. I put in 14 hour days in this community. I work my job at night time, I try to do my community service, and still I go home. Yes, I haven't come to anybody to do that. Business. I haven't stood on the street. <coughs> I do have to make everything and I have to pay that too. I do have to come home with food again. But I have served my community. I've worked with housing issues because I am the experienced guy with the housing problems. I have helped open schools when they've been shut down. I've helped these schools open up when they've been closed down. I've helped people with people with their homes when they've been shut down their jobs or, or uh, improperly accused of violations. I am one of the first ones that try to fight these sanitation people. Trust me, I have a history of fighting them straight on. I am the one that has been there for my community. My door is an open door policy in my office. People come to me every day with personal issues, with business issues, and my door is never closed. My phone rings 150 calls, 150 calls minimum a day. My wife sees it from 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning till midnight. Half my life I've lived with this lady, with, which I thank her for allowing me to be here. So I want you to know, you want a candidate that you're going to vote for, my vote is not against them. My vote is not a protest vote. On November the 7th, vote for Heshi Tishler to show that I am for the individual. Vote for Heshi Tishler that knows that I am one of you. Show them that we have a voice in this community. And I thank you all for coming in. Let me take my love. Our community is a unique minority in the city. We stand for traditional values at a time when such values are not only not respected, but looked upon as bigotry. As a city council member representing our community, you will be seen by the outside world as a leader in the community. How will you fight to protect the values of our community in a world where these values are not politically correct? Mr. Hartley, you may be said. In my opening, I talked about how serious this is, and this question is a wonderful segue to that. As a representative of the community, that is part of the sole purpose of what I need to do and what I intend to do. I don't know if I agree necessarily, Mr. Uh, Heber Dunn, to the, uh, to the question in its uh, pretense, because um, I think that to say that uh, we, our community is not valued, I think is kind of not entirely the truth. I think that there's misunderstanding. And I think that our community is the most beautiful community in the world. I think our community stands for values that the rest of the world would love, appreciate, and respect as much as anyone else. Unfortunately, two things. Number one, there's some misunderstanding. Number two, and I'll get to that in a second. Number two is that sometimes, sometimes we don't necessarily do enough to engage with the outside community in order to have the dialogue 
to have a chance to express our views, to express what we are about, to deal with some of the things that come up that our question starts. But even more so than that, society as a whole evolves. Society as a whole needs to continue working on this for every community. We are unique, and we need someone that has the sensitivity, the understanding, the depth, the character to be able to articulate the community's values to others, but also not always just call it the way I think you just said, oh, that we're not being respected, but actually understand that they maybe want to respect us if we go about it the right way. I grew up in a, when I, my father, when I was here, my father moved us to Venice for a couple of years. So I understand what hate crime is. I understand what bigotry is. I understand what it is to be chased by doors, called Jew, called worse names. I came home from Yeshiva one day, and uh, my mom said bad words. Something, and you know, you learn your friend. My mother sat me down for two hours with my father. Do you know where we came from? Do you know the Holocaust we lost our families? Do you know what bigotry is? My mother in the 60s and 70s, as far as many different ways. I work with different, different religions. I work with the Muslim religion. I work with the Jewish people. I work with the Christians. I work with different races. People are coming to me all the time for jobs and help, and I get them help. I help people get out of jail, send me money. It doesn't make a difference if you're Jewish or not. You need my help in the country. My two young men are in a foreign city, I'm better looking anyway. But I just want you to know, they don't understand the system that we came from 55 years ago. They don't understand what it is when I go to volunteer in the hospital or the nursing homes. To me, it makes a difference. People get packaged to Black, Spanish, Jewish. I hang it out. Sometimes they get angry. Why do you do something that's not the money left? And I explain it to them. Same way I explain it to my children. We will work with our community. We will work with our neighbors. My doors are open. If you ever come into my office, many different people. Imams, priests, rabbis, daily, hourly. So if you ever want to think that somebody doesn't understand the hate crime, somebody that will fight it to the last breath, somebody that will not put up with it, somebody will, that will make sure when the investigation starts to follow it through to the end, no, I'm not going to let you get a letter and not hide it. So ladies and gentlemen, yes, Heshi Fisher will stand there for you. And let me the seven to make sure you come out there. Mr. Yeager, thank you. Well, my view is that respect for everyone means respect for everyone, and that's across the board. So when we're asked to give tolerance or respect for any other community, that means that it has to come to us as well. I know my Messiah. I know what it is. I know how we live. And if people are asking us to give respect to things that we can't necessarily <coughs> allow into our homes and our communities, they have to understand that that's not the issue on our part. That's going to be respect for our own disorder. And that's how we were brought up and that's how we're going to live. But that doesn't mean that we disrespect anybody. We treat people with respect, we treat people with honor, we treat our fellow New Yorkers like the people that we are. And everybody deserves the same equal shot and living in New York free of bigotry. Hate crimes in New York City have gone up against you more than anybody else. And we know that. And we are doing their job, but the reality is that we are under attack. We're often under attack. We're under attack because of how we look, because of how we dress, because of how we speak, because of where we live. So we have an obligation to respect others, but we also have the right to demand respect from others. And that's what I'll fight for in city council. As, as somebody who's worked with elected officials throughout the city for as long as I've done, I have the relationships in every single borough of the city, in every, with, with elected officials of every ethnic, black, Latino, Asian, all of whom have endorsed me, or representatives of each group who have endorsed me over the last couple of weeks. Today. And I know how to work with others because that's what I've done my entire life in government. Because the rule was that you were 30 seconds, right? Okay, so I just wanted to um, respond. The question was, as far as I recall, not necessarily uh, the emphasis was on hated bigotry. It had to do with working with others, as Mr. Yeager was just mentioning, um, and uh, respecting the values. So it doesn't sound like to me like it was a matter of hate crimes at this point. Respecting values, values means not coming from a position of that they hate us all the time. The answer to every problem is not that they hate us. Again, you need to be proud. A position of strength is by recognizing and understanding that we are beautiful, our values are beautiful, and having the courage and the sensibilities to express that, to articulate that, 
to others in the government and not to come with this mentality of, you know, automatically it's coming from him. And I just feel like that needed to be uh, pointed out because that was not uh, the case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just want you to know these guys, what these guys, we cannot allow them to do this. I will not allow them to do this. We must work together, all of us, all three of us. You know, and I'm going to take a second here, that we should be concerned about every city, every way. Right now, there's a family in 49th Street that had a fire and their job, and I started this month to help them. We have to show love for one another. We have great organizations like Sola, Oregon, Misaska, Shemisaka, people that do so much good. I am jealous of them. Yes, I'm jealous of all of you. I'm proud of you. You are my hero. You're the ones who are fortunate to do good, and I thank my community for helping me and letting me raise my hands here. I promise you, November the 8th, when I roll up my screen, please, and get ready to rock and roll. I'm with you. Thank you. I just want to clarify the rules one more time. The 30 second is only if a candidate is mentioned. Thank you all for being here. Second question is There is a bureaucracy in the city that frustrates residents, and this concerns agencies and utility companies. For example, a building inspector can unilaterally issue a stop work order, and the owner has no recourse. Or the National Grid and Con Edison and sometimes take them years to set up service. This results in people losing thousands of dollars a month or having to move in without getting connected to gas. Additionally, sometimes after shutting down service, Con Ed or National Grid will take the time to turn it back on. The Public Service Commission is supposed to police these behaviors, but it's an agency without people. What would you propose to force utility companies or the Department of Buildings to have more accountability? It's officially you have 90 seconds. Well, this is what I do every single day. People get stop work orders, they're losing tens of thousands of dollars, they're evicted from their homes. I teach them, I guide them up in the I work in the line, I work in home office, I work with them. I believe that they can be done by the I work as a city council, we get the support. We need to change commissions. I can't have a commission that tell me one day and go, well, I have to protect my job. I see building department inspectors coming instead of writing one violation, saying, well, i got to write two more. I said, what do you mean? I'm the one who's there to teach you compliance. I'm the one who has been fighting for our people one by one. And if you want to hear the history, I've been to hundreds of homes. I've been to thousands of inspections. I'm teaching the people. I fight the city thousands and thousands of violations that me and my staff go and try to beat them on. And yes, we find technicalities to beat them. Yes, they have. They should have proposed legislation to take pictures. They take pictures of the building department when they have violations. Sanitation does take pictures. They only don't take the pictures when they don't want to. I've worked with the other government agencies, the DOB, the ACS for Child Services. I've worked with the Department of Housing. I've worked with Consumer Affairs. I've helped people get their licenses. I know how to navigate the system. I've done it. I've done it for the last 25 years. And I'm going to continue doing this. Now I can do it on a bigger scale. I can do it on a scale that will help my community. I won't allow them to torture us. Yes, I joke around, I want to be Commissioner Fire. Trust me, if I can do that, I will. I want to be Community Board Member Fire. Not you, but you. And I did mention you. I want to make this happen. I want to make this happen. And if you want somebody that's experienced, somebody that knows how to navigate the 312 government agencies. Mr. Tishler. Mr. Tishler. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Yeager. I agree with Happy. Uh, the building inspections are onerous. The violations that they issue are onerous. Uh, they, they take up an enormous amount of time, they take up an enormous amount of money, they take up an enormous amount of resources. And they keep people from doing what they want to do and what they should be able to do uh, just because the city has a desire to shake a couple of dollars out of the building project. Not right, wrong. And as a community board member, I know it, I've seen it, we've seen projects come before our board, but a council member's job is to find out when these problems happen, to serve as a liaison with the agency, to get the agency to back off. But that's a temporary fix. That's a project-by-project project fix. 
a long term solution used to be that the agency had to back off before they even start coming at you. So, what do I do? I would call in, I would have a hearing at the city council. I would bring the commissioner down with real live examples and say, look, a 4060, this is what happened. Explain why. A 49th seat, this is what happened. Explain why. Because I've driven by those projects and I don't see why you're coming after these folks to where they are. Uh, Hesh's idea about pictures is a perfect idea. There's a bill in the city council that would require that for sanitation tickets. It's not enough. We should require that for every single violation issue. I do 100% protection. And he sees a lot of these in his work as, as a professional. We should require that, and I would propose a bill to council to require that every single violation, no matter what, be accompanied by a photograph, photographic evidence of the violation. Mr. Hickey? You know, there's a concept, uh, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. So the way I look at this in terms of the specific question that, you know, asked and raised was, the problem is, is that a lot of times there's very little recourse because the violation that uh, they might have found in any, in any given situation, they, from the letter of the law point of view, have the justification to be able to, uh, to, to, to cite that. The problem is, is, is the spirit of the law. And the question is, is what's the mentality of, of the agent that's giving this citing, and why is it leading to a, work, a stopping work order? I think that the key here is that from the beginning of my campaign, and something that I, uh, I'm very proud that has been the foundation of my campaign is individuals. It's been very clear that from day one, this has been what it's been about for me from day one, absolutely about the individual. Not about special interests, not about, not about political forces that, have, uh, that carry votes or carry financial uh, uh, strength. It's about the individual. So people in this situation, you know, again, back to the spirit of the law and there's the letter of the law. We need to be able to come together and fight Fight, fight, fight for, for people saying, look, you might be able to come down any given day to a, to a, to a, to a building where they're, they're developing and you might be able to find this study. What, does it have to lead to a stop work order? Does it have to lead to that? Well, letter of the law? Maybe. The, 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 the challenge is, and, and what I plan on doing is by bringing these agencies together to make sure that the sensitivity from the bureaucratic agency to the people to make sure that just because the letter of the law might have cited something, the spirit of the law says, a little mention of that, a little understanding, that's what government, that's what we deserve as well. Um, it's gone 30 seconds, it was mentioned. It was mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but Is that correct, Brother Rappaport? I'm going to tell you something, guys. I deal with the inspectors. They speak to me. They tell me they're going to issue violations no matter what. So whatever you say, the spirit of the law, the letter of the law, they make the law so difficult. They change the law. These commissioners change the laws without our permission. They, they create bodies that when we beat them in their own codes, when we navigate the system properly, the mayor, the mayor Bloomberg and mayor de Blasio tell their organization, change the law. Don't let them beat us. Mr. I speak to the administration. I've got the 30 seconds, John. Yeah, I didn't see the clock either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to finish up one more minute. I understand what it is that these administrative judges tell us, and I speak to the administrative judges. We have to follow um, the code. Yes, sorry. Right. I, I, I just want to uh, quickly, um, I, I heard the answer to the city agency problem, problem buildings, but I don't think any of the candidates addressed my concern about the utility companies. Um, and um, if, if each candidate can just take 10 seconds or 15 seconds to explain to me uh, how we uh, get the utility companies to uh, be more accountable. Okay, we're we'll going in order. Mr. Yeager? Uh, it's very simple. We're going to bring them in front of the city council to hear then we're going to have oversight on them. Uh, it's true we don't regulate them, but we do have the right to have oversight there. And we're going to do that. And we're, and we're going to hold their feet to the fire. And we will talk to the PFC, and it'll come from the city of New York, an official complaint from the city to the CFC, saying this is what's going on, this is what we see in our community, make it stop. Ms. Yeah. Fragmentation is when things are all over the place, whereas unity is when things are together. But what I believe is the answer to many of these questions does not require brain science. This is not some, you know, some complicated thing from the standpoint of when you bring people together who are suffering from this challenge that many are suffering from, you bring them together and when you're together you are stronger. You use that strength in numbers, in unity, and you make these cases with all the examples that we are referring to, and that's how you get things done. 
My two young competitors don't understand that the national grid and the electric company are independent companies. Recently, it's only happened this year where the Department of Buildings has used their illegal power to push them around, telling them if we stop you, you stop. They never used to do that before. I want to set up an independent civilian commission with, the, with, uh, with, 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 with developers, with homeowners, with residents. Mr. Tishlin, 50 seconds are up. Thank you. City Council to stop this and put us back in control once and for all. For the next question, we call Rabbi Herschel Steinberg to come up. My name is Herschel Steinberg. I've been living in Moore Park for the past 41 years. I'm currently burdened with a massive property tax bill because I live in a condo which has a luxury tax. This is not Central Park we're talking about, but Borough Park. <laughs> the condo is a SEPCO project for low-income families. Across the street, if somebody has a three-family house, is paying half the property tax that I'm paying. My children who grew up here cannot afford to live in the neighborhood. One son moved to Staten Island. Another child lives on the outskirts of Borough Park on 21st Street and 63rd, 21st Avenue and 63rd Street. Borough Park is no longer affordable for those who grew up here. I'm a hardworking, tax-paying citizen, and I'm being punished with a luxury tax that I can't afford, and the prospect of getting older without having our children nearby. Many people my age are considering following their children and moving out of this district. Do you have any proposals to turn this trend around? Thank you. I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, I don't want you to move to the Staten Island. I want you to stay here in Borough Park. I don't want you to live in our neighborhood. And uh, taxation, real property taxation, is out of control. It's out of control for several reasons. Number one is, yes, it's our assessed valuation through the law. But primarily, with respect to condos and the differential between what condos, you know this because you have a condo, the differential between what condos are paying and what a real prop of a single family home is paying are astronomical. Uh, uh, you can have a seven or 800 square foot condo that's paying more money than a 3,000 square foot house. Why? You have property classifications of second home, not in New York City, not by the city council. The classifications of how property is classified is not done in the city. So what we can do in the city council is ask the state legislature to change the classification, but we can't change them on our own. When I get to the council, I will propose a home rule message. I'll work with our council members who have these kinds of uh, homes in their district, and we're going to get that passed. But ultimately, we're going to have to go to Albany, and we're going to have to fight for that. So the uh, first half of what uh, Ms. Thierry said, I completely agree with. Uh, we all know the condo tax situation and the adjustments that have been that written. The whole way that, that the system is being done is out of control. And it is a state issue. So what does the city council member do? And to some degree, it's the same thing that I mentioned before. We don't have an answer as city council member. This is what we're going to do on that level on the state. But this is where Councilman Hyam Dutch, Councilman Mark Traver, this is where you come together and you engage with everyone together and you lobby and you lobby and you fight. Because at the end of the day, there is nothing that a city council member could do unless they are bringing that force together, just like I mentioned by the other question. That is, on a, on, on a, on a, on a grand level, the only way that we're going to put the pressure on for this whole assessment, assessment and evaluation uh, uh, that, they, that they go, that they do to go about this, will be changed. But there was still one more thing left. Individual assessments. There's still the individuals. Yes, on the ground level, there's the state part of this. There's the evaluation code in general, how this all works. But what about the individual? We don't always have to just talk about, okay, what are we going to do to change that? As a city council member, it's what we both just said. Lobby, lobby, lobby. On the individual level, it's, it's fighting for that individual when they come to you. And when that assessment comes, know how to go about cutting the red tape, dealing with the bureaucratic parts of that, and helping each individual who has had an unfair assessment. I disagree. Department of Finance is in control of your house. I dealt with that. The Department of Finance is the one that tells us what the house is. Yes, we have to file with the Attorney General and the condo books. We knew this day was coming. I've been part of uh, condos which filed 421 tax abatements. I've known that this day was coming. Why are we waiting till now to start filing the tax code? I heard about the star abatement. 
I learned about the new tax abatement, Mr. Hester Steinberg, that was supposed to be continued. We all heard that this was coming. Why wasn't it coming? Why are we waiting to the last minute to deal after 8 or 12 or 30 years to fight for the parking, to fight the sanitation of the side of the street parking? I'm upset with the Department of Finance. You have a two-family house and they're telling you it's three-family because somebody's using your basement and making office. It's three-family, and that's it. Nothing you can do. I thought that. Months, years till I can get the classifications changed. I deal with these agencies. They do not listen. We need oversight. We are the bosses. No, not the state. We, the city, can control the Department of Finance. We can control the taxes. We can go to Albany and say, hey, why are we extending these tax abatements? Why haven't we worked it out? We gave you 25 years to work on this problem. Now you wake up and you triple and you our taxes. My taxes have tripled in the last eight years. My fines, you know, tickets and home violations have gone from 1500 to $2,000 to $10,000. Nobody even approved it. Not you. Some commissioner sits in his office with a lawyer and changes the law. And none of us can do anything. We in the city council can stop this. We sit with the other 51 members. I will sit with your fine judge, and I will make sure this changes. Thank you. Do you believe that the government should dictate the achievement's curriculum, particularly in regard to secular studies? No. Mr. Hikins. No. Are you yielding the, the one on the, the one Are you yielding the rest, the rest of the time? Well, I mean, there's a second part to the question as to how do I want to deal with some of those situations, but that's the second part of the question. That's not to you. If the answer is yes or no, the answer is an, an astounding, an outstanding, emphatic no. I am the first one that stood up and brought the op-ed into my show in Sweden and I said, listen, I'm willing to listen. Tell me what you got to say. And then I told him straight out, hey, you're wrong. Yes, my two competitors jumped onto the issue. I'm very proud of them, that they're going to back me on this, and we're not going to let you We're not scared of the op-ed. He's scared of us. We, he wants to give us some kind of advice that's fine. But my children came out fine. Most of our children came out fine. We don't have male detectives. We don't have people standing and shooting each other in our schools. We teach our children right. Our parents help out. Yes, I like aftercare programs for the working parents, mothers, and fathers. I like, I like special, more education for our children. I don't want sex education in our classes. I don't want the gay community in my classes. I don't know what they want to do at home, but not in my schools. And I will not allow it. I will not get his curriculum in. He has a good idea. Come on, come into my community. We'll make a town hall meeting. Can you bring it up to me? And we will make sure that this is taken care of. But he will not push us around. Not under my leadership. Not under my guidance. And I promise you, the same way I got most of my friends, my kids' friends through college, and I'm talking a good college, Toro College, a college that supports our neighborhood, a good organization. So yes, I do believe in secular organization, my dear friends, but I believe it to be controlled by my achievements, by my voices, by my teachers, and by us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeager. Give us answer first before we have a... Yeah, my answer is no, emphatically no. And I said this on television last, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, the answer is no. I went to Hasidic Hasidah Shishiva. I'm proud of my education. My son learns in the Shiva. I'm proud of his education. Our choices for education are made by our parents. I don't want any outside group. I'm not going to give them air time by mentioning their name, but they are an attack against our machine. Make no, make no mistake about it. They're not just uh, an organization that's there uh, that, that, that's trying to do betterment for our community. They are on attack against our community. Our elected officials know it, and they've spoken out against it. I'm glad that my colleagues here on the stage have spoken out against it, but I'm going to fight them. And, you know, I'm very concerned about what happens in the next administration. Right now, uh, uh, sir, you know, the, the mayor is uh, likely to win re-election, and uh, he'll have another term. I don't know. You don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in the next term. There's currently some sort of an investigation. We have to be vigilant. They cannot set with an army sheet period. 
We pay the tuition, we make the determination what our achievers are going to do, and we're proud of the education that we give our children. I'm proud of mine, you should be proud of yours, and I'll stand firmly against them within try. I know, and I've dealt with budgets, audits, 
I dealt with city agencies. We must review everything. We must have the security people in there. We must bring the people in. How am I going to control this in the city council? I'm going to put together a bill. I'm going to make sure that we go after each individual student. We have to care about our students. How many of our students cannot make it through regular season they need special education? In my building, we have a young lady who helps these special, beautiful children all day long. They come and go. And I sometimes see how sad their parents are. We must worry about each child. We must get our classroom sizes down. We must support programs like the infant program. They care, they care about special education. Mr. Fisher, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm talking about specifically that security. She was under 300 students. Right. I don't and want to lie for that. There, there should be no excuses that we get security for all the students. We have to find a way to make sure that this money is distributed properly and we go uh, organization by organization that is registered, that is a, a real yeshiva, that is a real synagogue, that takes care of our children. We have to find a way and we will find a way to make sure they get the security like we get it. Mr. Yeager. Uh, I had something to do with writing this bill, uh, and I'm proud of my work here in the Council of Greenfield. We worked on this bill for five years. <coughs> two administrations, two mayors, two city councils. And it was a hard fight. And it was a hard fight. And the original draft of this bill had 200 as a cap. And then they negotiated. And they said, well, 250. And we negotiated. And then they kept on pushing us. And finally, in this administration, the mayor kept his word. He said he was going to do it. But the number was higher. The number was too high. And you're right. I'm not going not gonna to disagree. The number is too high. It should be for a lower number of children. When I get to the council, we're going to prove that this bill has worked. There's a beautiful school booth, a security booth right outside this yeshiva. So many of our yeshivas are taking advantage of it. 50,000 children across the city. Yeshiva students, parochial students, non-public school ed, uh, students uh, have, have use of this $20 million program. So we're going to expand it, we're going to make the threshold number lower, and now that we can prove to the administration that it works, we're going to go in there with a stronger head to get it done. It's Mr. Yes, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I've already gone for work, and I've uh, been having uh, in-depth conversations with, again, Councilman Chaim Deutsch, uh, who is already active in moving towards making sure that the 300 threshold ends. And, you know, I think this is kind of a very appropriate question in relation to what I was mentioning before in terms of uh, who gets what? Who gets what? Individuals, groups, big groups, small groups. You know, I remember my father passed with such a leading role, playing such a leading role passing tax. And I remember the first time someone said to him, parent, are we getting that money? Are we, are we getting help from that? And other things like that. I've been walking the streets for two months. I've been walking those streets and I am pretty, pretty confused by what I'm hearing from parents. And I've already called heads of MISIS asking them, can I ask you a question? I want to understand. Why do the parents feel this way? I've had this conversation with some people here. And there's an answer to it, but at the end of the day, there's this feeling that that is something that has happened that is unfair. 300 students, doesn't it seem too often, doesn't it feel too often that it's the powerful, the big and powerful that get things more often than the individual and the weaker and the smaller? Well, I think that's something that has to change. And I look forward to specifically on this one, uh, making sure that that 300 student threshold uh, is Many times uh, there are interagency conflicts uh, when it comes to city service. They pass the buck from one agency to the, to the other. A good example is, for instance, on St. Paul, uh, DOT will claim that it's DEP's problem, DEP will say that it's DOT's problem, and then the problem goes unsolved and the uh, sinkhole remains. What plan, uh, and that's just one example, what plan do you have to to force agencies to take responsibility and uh, solve problems. Ms. Diego. Well, the, as a community board member and yourself as a sister as a district manager, you know that the, the addressing the problem starts at the community board level where we're supposed to have a district service cabinet that comes in, sits down where interagency conversation happens. But often, you're right, uh, they go back and then they come back and say, well, that agency is responsible, that agency is responsible. In the meantime, the sinkhole remains. Uh, the council member's job is to pick up the phone and call the commission and say, this is what's going on in my neighborhood. Are you responsible or not? The commissioner says no, call the other agency that the commissioner says is responsible. If that commissioner says no, get them on a conference call and they can say it to each other. 
And that's the way the government is supposed to work. The council has oversight over every single one of these agencies. And if you get them on the phone together, and they're both going back, then you bring them in front of the council in the hearing, you swear them in, and you find out what's going on. That's the way you run government. And that's what I'll do with the council. Mr. Yeah, so much of this sounds so so kind of like um, repetitive. A lot of these questions, you know, making it sound like we're looking to reinvent the wheel over here about topics that we all are confronted with. Um, I don't know about everyone out there, but I think that there's a, there, there might be a sentiment out there that people are tired of politics as usual. Well, this is how it's done, and this is how we're going to do it, and what? The elected officials before us have, haven't figured out, they haven't broken that code? What, what, what's missing over here? If, this, if it's so simple, then, oh, yeah, you should bring it together, then, then the question becomes, well, then how come it hasn't happened? Whatever topic we're talking about, and this one specifically, well, we're going to bring everyone together, and we're going to force. Well, first of all, I don't believe in forcing anyone's will. Um, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not, a, not at all a in that. I believe in working with people. But my point is, is that why do we always just... You know, stay over the same the same business over here. We're going to do this and this and this. And then how come it's still an issue? Maybe something needs to be done differently. Maybe may, maybe things need to be done differently in the sense that we need to start looking at this as not just politics as usual, but maybe we need to start electing our politicians and our elected officials who aren't really politicians and are actually going to care. And yes, for those who have the, I don't even understand it. It's not about heart. What else is it about? So, uh, I'm sorry, the answer is the answer so is what that, I propose. What uh, I propose you know, is that you that I want elected officials who, instead of just saying the obvious, like as I said, just what reinventing the wheel. That is the standard answer to almost every question, and we've heard it for years and years and years and years. And how come all these challenges are still so much and so present? And so, what I'm saying is. Maybe we start looking at how we pick our elected officials a little bit differently. And we say, you know what, someone who has proven that all he does his whole life is care about people, maybe that will lead to some differences. Well, my whole life I've cared about people. And I want to tell you very simple. I deal with the DOT. I deal with the DOB. I deal with the DOT, the sanitation department. I've tried to get commissioners to talk to each other. I actually go meet the commissioners. They don't listen to you. They point up to the mayor's office. I had a rabbi recently who was trying to get his yeshiva fixed up. He went through every single department, a year and a half. Finally, at the last, last line, the guy says to me, the commissioner says, no, I'm not going to approve it. And the rabbi got up and got angry at the commissioner, the Jewish commissioner. The commissioner says, get out, go above my head. There's no above your head. You're the boss. I've spoken to commissioners, I've spoken to the DOB and, the, and, the, and HPD, working on the same building. Each one is giving me fines every single day. And I'm telling them, one to the other, I know bureaucracy. Our politicians don't do anything. They haven't cared till now. Now you wake up, you're going to care after all these laws and regulations are made. You can't do nothing. The city council can say, listen guys, you're going to listen to us. We're going to make the changes and you will do what I want to do. I know how to navigate the system. Recently, a client called me up. He had a problem with his building. And I told him, well, I've been working on it for four months. Me and my son almost got this objection approved. They called our beautiful councilman and sent them to the high office. And they tried to call the commissioner. The commissioner just laughed it off and denied it. You can't just call commissioners and think that it works out that way. There's a system. We need to change the system. We need to tell them we are the boss. We need to change the laws now where they respect us. Because they change these laws without our permission. And you think by calling them up as a city council is going to work? The answer is no. I need to work for my guys. My sleeves are ready to go. I have plans in effect that are ready to go to make these changes and threaten the Department of Buildings and the Department of Houses and the Department of Sanitation. You're going to change. You're not going to talk to my community. I live here. I know the problem. I suffer these problems. I hear the people. I'm sorry. Thank you. And the next question, we call on Yahosh Orange, your first driver from the Vision Team Yeshiva. Okay, correction. Um, I drive for Yeshiva Hassan Seifer. <clears throat> my name is Yahosh Orange. I drive for Yeshiva Hassan Seifer. I'm a bus driver in Bar Park. During my daily route, I've come across many situations 
which I feel make the streets less safe and can cause more traffic congestion. Many of these things are illegal. For, in for instance, vehicles passing blinking lights on school buses, or drivers talking on cell phones while distracted, or a lot of times these electric scooters which disregard all manner of traffic laws. All of these can contribute to more stress and danger for both the drivers and pedestrians. What will you candidates do to make our streets safer and the traffic flow more manageable? With less closures, particularly during peak school pickup and drop off times. Also, one more thing uh, is uh, many bus drivers face a nightly challenge of parking the buses. What can be done to address that? Thank you. Yes, uh, well, so first of all, in terms of um, what do we have in mind to do in order to, you know, less congestion, uh, dealing with traffic and safer. Uh, we don't have the time to go to check the website, yonihiking.com. We have the Smart City Initiative. I think everyone is also quite familiar with the plan to alleviate alternate side parking. Uh, these are examples of things that we have laid out and we have explained. And for now, because of time, we're not going to go into detail about it, obviously. But to me, the questions that you brought up come back to what I believe is what the people deserve. More than ever, I think, and I said before that I love this community. I want to explain what I mean by that even more. I have heard so many wonderful ideas. I don't believe that I, any of us, should pretend or fool you or try to convince you that we have or we are smarter than the average citizen out there. We who walk the streets, we who drive the buses, come together and, and talk about this in a way that we will we will figure out and, and discuss different plans, ideas, how to do how to compromise. Because without that, there's gonna be a thousand people coming up with thousands of ideas. We you know, our elected official comes up with an idea, maybe it's a good idea, maybe the people like it, maybe they don't, maybe it'll pass, maybe it'll own Yes, town halls. Yes, community engagement. I do believe that that is the answer to, to, to a lot of things. I do believe in the people. I believe that the Borough Park community, I believe that in people in Flappers and Midwood and, not, in, and other areas, I believe it's time that they have engagement from their elected officials so that they could really, really play a role in their own challenges and problems. I don't believe, and I've said this so many times, I don't believe the elected officials are here with all these genius answers and the regular citizen just doesn't get it. They just don't understand. It's not true. The secret is out. It's not true. We are going to have these town hall meetings, which I committed to. I said, just after one month, I didn't do it. it you say to me, you lied. I am going to have these town hall meetings because we are going to continue doing exactly that and come up with solutions together. <laughs> But there's a security person over here. Um, we asked very strictly that there be no applause and has been consistently um, Again, this is where my expertise comes into effect in my experience. I came up with a three-point plan that my competitors started to take ideas from. I wonder if I, I am, I'm a father that drove these kids to school. I'm the one that passes the, 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 to, to try to get those boys on time to yeshiva because the Rebbe screams and hollers, absent, absent, absent. I'm there when my, my wife says, you better get that boy to school. If not, I'm going to drive you. So I understand what it is to trap the gesture. The other day I was trying to drive to a friend's house from 39th Street to 55th Street on 15th Avenue. It was 45 minutes. I have an idea at 3.0 plan to create 4,000 more parking spots in Borough Park. And it's not just for Borough Park, it's for my entire community, Borough Park, Midwood, Flatbush. I'm going to create a parking ride system that will allow you to park your car in this place. <coughs> Get on this little parking rides and go shopping. The main avenues during the hours of 9 to 7 will be free. You'll have an unloading and loading. Go back and get your car and pick up your people. Instead of driving for 45 minutes and trying to get in the spots and never getting anything accomplished, park your stuff in our parking lot. Get on a bus ride and be in your parking area in five minutes. Leave your stuff there or bring it back on the bus. How do we pay for this? We pay for it with the municipal act. I've already been sketching the ideas in my office. I've been looking at any private contracts that's been cleared over this place. And I even have a location in the sanitation place that we plan on giving away to somebody for nothing. My plan is a very simple plan. I'm going to have the traffic cops, instead of stopping traffic or giving me tickets, move traffic along. 
We're not going to let them give us. They give us their job. They give us their job. I'm not going to have police officers chasing me on the, on the highway. I'm at 45 to DA that they break their they break, they break smash on us. I don't want them hiding and giving us this. I need them to protect you and your life. You need to. And my bus is at night. We're able to park for three in our community in our parking lots. Anybody registered here? We're we'll parked here. Our neighborhood is able to park here. Okay. Let me ask you a question specifically. Electric scooters are illegal on our streets. They should be removed. If somebody's caught driving one, they should be pulled over. And the scooter should be confiscated. That's city policy right now. And if it's not happening, you see, we should let the police know that there's a trouble spot, and we should get it taken care of. Because they are dangerous. They're dangerous to the people who are riding them. They're dangerous to the people who are crossing the street. They're dangerous to people who are operating uh, tonnage of vehicles, and they just screwed in and out and do whatever they want. They got to be stopped, and we have to be stopped using our police. It's just you know, simple common sense. I put out, uh, you know, I've already had a several point plan. I had a four point plan, a three point, two point. My plan is a transportation plan. Um, and, you know, my colleagues, we all have different ideas. You know, I think mine are good, I think some of theirs are good. That's the way the debates are supposed to work. I have a plan for community control over over uh, traffic closures, over street closures, whether it's for making a movie, whether it's for doing non-emergency work, that before the city lets a permit out to block off a certain street at a certain time, they have to go to the community board. The community board decides whether it's right or wrong, and if the community board says, no, this is not a good time, pay to their job, to their time, whatever, they give the, the agency an alternative, and the alternative is chosen by the agency. No non-emergency work is done without the public and local community. That's community control. And that's important because we know our community better than some guys that live in that. And just looking a day on the calendar and saying, this is when we're going to send out a bunch of figures to your neighborhood. Uh, traffic control officers are extremely important. I spoke about that in my plan. I've been talking about that throughout the campaign. We have to deploy them without the district. Wherever there are trouble points, we know where the trouble points are. Some are in different places, some different days. But we deserve that. It's a resource that other neighborhoods get, and we're not getting our fair share. So we have the right to go and ask for it. We're going to get it, and we're going to bring it to our neighborhood. Okay, when issued a fine in New York City by any city agency, part of the target is your guilty and to include an innocent. How do you suppose we change that? Question number one. In, in, in other words, enable people to uh, report the, the hard earned money is taken, enable them to city to have to prove that they're guilty. Another related question is it just seems that the amount of fines are excessive. The parking ticket is $115, civil penalty starts at $5,000. Do you think it's possible to bring down the amounts of these fines? Well, this is again what I do. Um, these fines are ridiculous. I go and fight these violations all the time. These agencies these change the rules without our permission. And I won't allow it. As city council, I'm going to sit down with the city council member and say, hey guys, you can't change the rules without an independent committee. You can't change the rules without the city council. My friend Ryan Berg sits on the building department committee. I'm going to have a track with him. Why are you letting them get away with it, Ryan? We're going to work together to stop this. Fines are ridiculous. I know last year that the DOB issued, I mean the ECB, which controls the fines, $2.2 billion in fines. I'm not even going to talk that the building department created $100 million, the only profitable agency. I need to, for the time you see a government agency making a profit, then you know what you're about. This is unacceptable. I've been trying to fight them for years. I know the codes, I know the laws. And each time we find a way to fight them, they change the laws on us. I don't even know who, I promise you. I don't know who. Maybe somebody in the city council is helping them or they're ignoring it. Maybe somebody in the assembly because it is state control. Why are they allowing these inspectors? There's 200 new inspectors that have just been hired in the last month. They don't help us. Do they come to a job site and ask them, can you help me? Can you tell me what's going on? Maybe you can teach me how to correct it. No, it's not our job. What do you mean teach your job? You're the inspector. Not just to write the violation. Show me the right way. Tell me what you want. Because sometimes we listen to them and they come back and issue another violation the next day. These fines are ridiculous. They abuse their privileges. And that's the first thing I'm going to do. Mr. Andrews. Thank you. Well, uh, the first part of the question, uh, you shouldn't be guilty before, uh, you know, before you've proven yourself innocent. It's a basic due process. Uh, I think we all know that, whether you're a lawyer or not. Um, you should have the right to have a fair hearing or some impartial judge. And that's what city law currently gives you. Unfortunately, the agency comes in and says, you did X, and now it's your problem to go prove otherwise. 
That's why my idea for a bill that would require photographic evidence of any sort of violation, no matter what agency issues it, from health to and at a restaurant or yeshiva, from fire at any building, from buildings department, sanitation for the spray litter that I'm talking about, uh, which is the, the, the vexing concern that we hear about on the streets, where, you know, I clean my house in front of my house, and then, you know, all is good, I go inside, somebody drops a coffee cup, I get a $100 fine. That's not right. It's a tax. It's not just a fine. And so what we need to do is get photographic evidence. It's hard to sum. It's very easy for the, for the enforcement officers to do. And that'll give us the ability, our, our community, the ability to fight those fines. As to the excessive uh, fines, you're right. Um, uh, fines that are for building violations, $5,000, $10,000, $15,000, without any common sense whatsoever, without a thought as to whether or not it's actually going to make somebody safer, without a thought of whether or not it's going to actually stop an unsafe condition, those are outrageous. Mm -hmm. those, those need to be revisited, and the city council can and should and must address them, and that's what I'll do. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. I would have loved to have gone first on this question because uh, in what was, and I've joked about this, the world's fastest net plan campaign, uh, we had a uh, pretty extensive platform up on our website, and from day one, uh, the photograph idea is certainly, I think that we all, uh, it's a wonderful thing, I think we could all agree, almost, I would almost say that every single person, this is not partial, would agree that you should have photograph uh, images on any sanitation, they can no doubt about that, but again, I, uh, I, went, I went second, but to be honest, uh, I must I must say that that was on our platform. That's something that my father actually has uh, talked about for a while, and we put that on our platform. We put that on our website from day one, and whoever your council member ends up in, uh, I hope that that is something that we make a move on real quick, because we could all be on that, right? So absolutely, that is unquestionably um, uh, a specific uh, needed uh, law that needs to be required, and that's going to change everything as far as the sanitation tickets. Uh, which, of course, are not fair. I think the second part of the question, which is a little bit more broad, and can we do something about that? Yes, you know, I think that there's been a theme here of a lot of these questions where a lot of it does come back to the same, well, you, what do you do about this problem? And you bring people together and bring the agency together and have dialogue. And I'll say that what I believe uh, distinguishes me is one of my skill sets that I believe I bring to the table is relationship building, uh, communication. This is something that I... Uh, I, so as a social worker, have spent many years on, and I think through those communication skills, through those relationship building, through knowing how to work together, I believe I have a uh, very good chance in helping with some of uh, what with those questions are. I'd like to welcome that as soon as at the we have to get to the news. Now, the power of the councilman. In reality, the power of a councilman under the city charter is very limited. Many decisions are made between the mayor and the council speaker behind closed doors. Whom do you support the speaker and why? If you are undecided, what are your minimum requirements for a prospective candidate to gain your vote to be speaker of the council? Okay. Um, in reality, the power of a councilman under the city charter is very limited. Many decisions, if not most, are made between the mayor and the council speaker behind closed doors. Whom do you support for speaker and why? If you are undecided, what is the minimum requirement for a prospective candidate to gain your vote? It's to you. Thank you. Um, so the answer to that is, uh, as, as you've seen from Council Greenfield, of course, in the last eight years, part of how, how decisions get made in city council is being on leadership. And Council Greenfield has been on leadership in the city council since nearly when he was elected. He's been on the budget negotiating team, and he's chairman of the land for the last four years. That brings resources back to our community. And yes, it's true, a lot of decisions do get made behind closed doors. But the council should be more open. And I've answered surveys from Citizens Union and from other uh, organizations that I've talked about my ideas for how the council must be more democratic, including if somebody has a council member has a particular bill 
and other council members can't lock it down with, uh, by claiming any privilege uh, as a result of the cards of past councils. Uh, the council does need to be more democratic. It is a 51 member board of directors of the city of New York, and it needs to reflect that all 51 people have the right to have ideas heard and to have them negotiated out in public. Uh, in terms of the council speaker, uh, you know, I think it's important that uh, we wait until November 8th to have that conversation. Um, for obvious political reasons, but the, the person that I'm looking at would, do, would bring the skills of caring about our community, understanding our community, uh, knowing how to negotiate, having a strong and firm hand, we're going to make sure that the city council is an equal body of government with the rest of the city, and to make sure that that council member, who will ultimately become speaker, understands the needs of our community from his or her very core. As someone who uh, is very proud of the claim of not being an experienced politicker, I will tell you, and which I've also said that I hope to God, God willing, in 20 years from now, as an elected official, they will still not call me an experienced politicker. My answer is very, very simple. I've been uh, meetings already and uh, discussions with people uh, that that question starts, you know, coming up and trying to kind of sway you a certain way and you know play with the whole political. Uh, mechanisms that go on and as i've said this on the radio everyone out there should know the politics out there that we don't like it's worse than you think it is worse than you think and let me make clear uh in terms of speaker to me it's about working with the good people that you believe are the good people and working out with them together not based on back channels not based on what will then give me more power and this is where your belief in the candidates comes out more than anywhere else yes the question is very very valid ultimately the speaker will be the person that will therefore make make so much of policy and what and where their where their effort is going to be and therefore as citizens of this of this district that's where the question must be asked who is the person that you believe is there, not for themselves, but for the people? And I hope to God, I hope that you believe that that is me. I've been very critical of the last two speakers. I haven't liked them at all. Uh, me and my staff have been looking over, and I knew this question might come up. We're looking at eight impossible candidates this year. We have been determined to be. As my opponents have said, in the record day, I'll come up with a better idea of what I'm going to look for. So I'm stuck with the speaker one am going to because you're not going to get an answer on me on that. What I will do with the rest of my time is tell you about my last issue that I have. My last issue that I have is that these violations are being illegally run against them. Do you understand that we are guilty? Do you understand that the judges that I've spoken to, the administrative judges, have no experience in the field? I stand in building the public sites. I stand in garbage all day long. I go to people's homes that live in squad and try to get the better. So ladies and gentlemen, if you be quiet for one second, I just want to tell you how I want to address this issue. I spoke to the judges that tell us that we have to rule against you 90% of the time. These administrative judges tell me if we don't rule against you, we get fired. They find ways to hurt us. We're going to fight all the administrative judges. They're independent. They don't belong to the government department, so they control the about We need a change. We need to bring people from these communities up there. We need to bring the developers, the contractors, people who have experience in construction, people who have experience in sanitation, and come to the judge, and come to the new administration. You know when you get a drive in the day, you never win. This is exactly what goes to the you walk up and say you never win. You do have a speech over there, you win. But I remember the session. I remember the session. The mayor and the governor are in disagreement over congestion pricing, which would tax those entering Manhattan and subsidize uh, bridges and buses. Given the enormous travel between Borough Park, Flatbush, our communities, and upstate, what is your opinion of this proposal, of the city proposal of, uh, of uh, Price. In addition, the city recently announced a pilot program which would ban deliveries in select streets during rush hour, which eventually would be expanded to other neighborhoods. Would you vote for this in this district or fight against it? We'll start with Mr. Eichen. Number one, I uh, certainly uh, emphatically say I'm against uh, the first part of the question, totally against it. Ultimately, it's going to cost the, uh, the middle income families, going to cost the, uh, the, um, the people that are already 
clearly getting by with uh, cost of living, um, even more, more taxes, more taxes, more taxes. You know, I, I, I get that ne taxes are a part of, necessary part of life, it's a ne necessary evil, but um, we, ne we need to go out of our way in every, to every time possible where there's a suggestion of another tax, another tax, no, no, no. You know, what, are, what we're able to do with lower taxes, I'm not gonna sit here and say, I'm going to lower taxes. I'm probably not, I'm probably not here. Okay. Um, but we have to fight against any new taxes. As far as the uh, second question, do you the second question? About the, the uh, banning uh, deliveries. Oh, so I, I applaud the uh, mayor's plan in general. I think that um, I think maybe because the nature of politics in general, we become very cynical. Uh, I am not a traffic expert. Just to be clear, I'm not running in this campaign as a traffic expert. As a matter of fact, I'm not really running in this campaign as any expert. Uh, I like people, I care for people I want to understand. I don't think that this is rocket science, but I applaud his, his, his plan. I think that some of his plan was actually stuff that we have done in, uh, in, in, in Borough Park itself. Uh, I think that there might be parts of this plan that we need to look at. Like when someone comes up with an idea, unless it's so obvious from day one, it makes no sense. You say, good, government's thinking of something. Let's see how it goes. We'll evaluate it as it goes. I am an expert in dealing with this bill. And, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I don't have the money. I haven't been uh, working too much. But uh, I am an expert in this bill. The basic pricing of the real tax came up about seven years ago. And I didn't agree with the debt. Unacceptable that you have our neighbors coming in from different states, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, having to pay a tax to come in. Pay an extra toll. We've raised our tolls all over the places. We're raising our MTA buses. We're raising it all over the place. Now you're going to punish our neighbors. You're going to punish our kids that want to do business who live here with us. Now they have to live out of town because they can't afford it, but they still live here and do business. I have a lot of people that have sold their homes in here because they just can't keep living here. I've helped them. I've shown them a way to be in compliance and, and, and fix up a lot of their issues. First thing they do is sell them, they move to Jersey. They didn't give up their jobs. They're teachers, they're rabbis, they're delivery men. What do you mean, now they're gonna come in and give in, they're bringing their business over here, they have to pay a special tax? Unacceptable. How are we gonna to try to use deliveries? Again, you have my ideas. We can do our park and ride and test it in our system. Create loading and unloading zones between certain hours. After that, we can't do that. We will move the buses off the street and make their park somewhere else to create a few more hundred parking spots. We have ways to stop this congestion. We have ways to make it work. Seven years we had this answer to go. And nobody came up with an idea. Now you're waiting for us. Now you're waiting for me. Well, I have the answer. And on November day, again, my dreams will go up. Just the end of well, I'm, I oppose to Jeff's pricing uh, in its current name, its current term, whatever it is that we call it. You know, it's an idea that came up about a decade ago. Uh, opposed it then, didn't like it, still don't like it because it's a tax. It's a tax on middle class New Yorkers uh, who move about their city. And it's a regressive tax because it punishes those who can't afford it the most. So if you're rich and you want to get into a big suburban and you want to scoot around and they raise some poles, you'll keep going and it's all good. But if you, you're in the middle class and they start putting poles where they weren't any before and they start raising poles where they're, they're a little bit lower now, you're going to pay a little more. In some cases, you're going to pay a lot more. And it's coming out of food for your family. So I oppose it uh, and I'll fight it and make it right on this. Uh, and he, he opposes it. And we're going to work together to make sure that it doesn't get imposed on us in the city. Uh, in terms of using traffic flows by deliveries, this is something that the community has to work with together with the stores in our neighborhood. This is a big deal. Make no mistake about it. We see it all the time. The bulk of the traffic in Borough Park has to do with double parking. It has to do with truck stopping in the middle of the street. There are a number of things we can do, uh, including, including setting up places where there can be offloading of trucks during business hours, but more importantly, to try to get stores, whether it's by asking nicely or by incentivizing it, or at the end, by re requiring it through regulation, to have deliveries after hours, to have deliveries in the middle of the night, to try to ease some of the burden on the community during the day. We don't want trucks making deliveries between 8 in the morning and 9 in the morning when the school buses are all over the street. We need to do something about it, we need to do something now. <laughs> the next, uh, next group of questions have a slightly changed format. We're going to have a lightning round. Candidates will answer in two or three words. Keep it simpler. We'll start with Mr. Tischler for all the questions. Where do you vacation in the summer? 
Okay, for the next question, somebody submitted in advance. For many in our community, the after school voucher program has been, has been a tremendous relief, but there are thousands more parents on waiting lists for years. What concrete steps will you be taking to bring more vouchers to eligible parents in the community? So, it, the, there are two parts of the problem. Number one, as we know, that in, as the as minimum wage has raised, the income eligibility has to move along with it. And so it's becoming a problem where people who are on the list are getting knocked off. And the second problem is that the list has been expanded. So I would, uh, as you know, the mayor has made a commitment uh, when he first ran and he kept it, which was in terms of baselining the priority options into the city budget. But we do have to push, we do have to do more. There are council members who are in the council now who are supposed to do more council meetings. Uh, Levin, uh, Councilman, uh, Councilman Greenfield, obviously, Councilman Dutch, uh, Councilman Trigger, and a whole bunch of others. We have to do more, we can do more, and concrete steps are simply telling the mayor that we want it in the budget. <laughs> yeah, I had a conversation with uh, Head of the Marsa just the other day, and he was telling me, uh, I agree, disagree, but he, I've been taking input from people in terms of how we deal with some of the challenges that still exist, whether it's vouchers or anything else that we are in the risk for or you know, programs that we're eligible for. And his feeling was is that if we show that we want to comply, and if they, uh, if they see that, and then we also show that we want to uh, work with them, and then also make our case as to why the, some, of the, uh, some of the regulations need to be changed, he feels that City Hall has been very accommodating. I think that I would also make an assumption that many here, uh, from, a, uh, from a policy point of view, from a politics point of view, I would venture to guess that Mayor de Blasio, we don't feel the same way from a liberal conservative point of view. Um, I'm not asking, but I'm assuming that. But I have spoken to many elected officials, and they do believe that more so than not, Mayor de Blasio and his agency have been responsive, that they are a willing ear at the very least, again, as opposed to whether you agree with him on his policies from a liberal conservative point of view. I want to believe that. If we do our job and we work together and we make our points as to, hey, this is great that we've gone till here, but it needs to be better, City Hall will comply and try to make it better. Okay. So I forgot to say a time limit for this. We're going to keep it for 30 seconds. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm discussing this about program. It's not working. Why haven't everybody gotten it? Why haven't I gotten a job great? Why aren't we using our tax break for the private citizens who are paying tuition for the yeshivas? It has not worked. We're trusting the mayor again. City council can do it. There's money in the budget. There's hundreds of millions of dollars that are being distributed to the schools, and we're not watching. We're not being administrated to be correct. The city council until now hasn't done anything about it. As I told you again, out of the 86 billion dollars, we have to administrate it right here. We're going to be the city council. We're going to be the administrator. We're going to be the budget directors and the auditors. I know that we can make changes. I know we can make this. Yeah, really. I know we can make the voucher program better. And I, as a paying father that has suffered in the last 24 years, I promise you now, I'm a little bit This is again one of my main concerns. You have a question from Malcolm J. What do you suggest to solve the parking nightmare? Would you support the fire department to remove fire hydrants where possible uh, and put them near bus stops or near corners to available to make available more spots? And the census area should not be a problem for fire trucks to have 20 feet longer hoses. Well, again, I, uh, I, I ask everyone to check out our Smart City Initiative. Uh, everyone's familiar with the Alton Sites Parking uh, Plan and the Cleaner Streets Program, uh, which has already been endorsed by, uh, uh, not endorsed, I'm sorry, uh, they have expressed support to be a public advocate. Uh, that would go a long way towards uh, alleviating some of the traffic the nightmare uh, that we have to deal with every single day. We have put out, we have laid out ideas that are, I want to just tell everyone that the ideas that we have laid out in our Smart City Initiative, I want to tell everyone a little secret where they came from. You ready? Google. Google. You know what I mean? That, you know what happened? I went on Google and saw what is being done in other places in the world. and. It was almost shocking to me that it hasn't been talked about till now, but we have a pretty extensive plan that we've laid out. The only I can not comment if you can. This is a. Uh, okay. We have both the size two parts. That means you can double park your car. So we have that in effect already. My issue, my deal with the parking issues, you park in my lot. So that alleviates more traffic. Very simple plan. 
Um, and that uh, uh, has been with the issue again, the question, the question, the question is that, and I go back to it, about the placing the fire hydrants next to the fire I believe we can move the fire hydrants because it costs us a lot of money. Again, I'm not going to start spending money. I'm not looking at cities in Europe or suburbia to make crime cleaning machines on the street that open the side of the street parking. I'm actually telling you I have issues here now. I'm not backing into my streets. Let me get it out of your way right now. We can put GPSs in cars. We can make them move and in, in, the, in, the, in the cleaning street and stuff. And tell them, hey, we're going to move it now. You'll get it fixed. Fire hydrants, I believe that they're, they're, we should maybe lower the parking area to about five feet. Uh, Mr. Yeager? Wait a minute. Lower the thing to five feet so we don't get the tickets. And try to move fire hydrants, not to cook by buses, because the buses were blocked as a vector. Uh, well, the, as I said, uh, it's not a good thing to do. Okay. Uh, moving moving uh, fire hydrants is costly, but more importantly, they're strategically located uh, locks deliberately to provide hydrants every several you know, feet, whatever it is, so that they are strategically located around the block. So moving them is not necessarily uh, something that we can accomplish. But uh, there has been, there have been ideas in the city council, they haven't moved because the fire department had opposed them, about two ideas. Number one is reducing the area that you can't park on either side of the fire hydrant from 15 down to 10. And number two is, and this is very important, because there are a lot of dead hydrants in the city, uh, and they are just still there, even though they're no longer active hydrants. And this would be, and there, was, there was a bill to require the city, the fire department, to mark either the active or the inactive one so that they could return those yeah. positive actions. So we have a question from Mr. Markowitz. How will you deal with increased spending to protect New York City from becoming another Detroit? Or keep that spending in a sustainable manner without punishing working people? Well, recently, uh, over the holidays, we had a natural robbery as a flash. I don't understand it. When we say the same way in New York City, and we have robbed How does this happen? Because we're too busy ticketing. We're too busy having our police officers do other things. We need to stop that. We can't have a guy hiding on Avenue J where traffic flows on one block 20 minutes giving us tickets. Why isn't he out watching for the criminals? Why isn't he stopping the criminals? Why are we moving traffic along and keeping our little traffic officers watching that? I don't want to spend more money. I want to make sure that we use the resources that we have now to stop crime. We can do it with the help of the show that we're doing a wonderful job. I love you both for Dr. Gasco. I love you, Katz, and, and my client, George. All of you guys who are wonderful. I'm jealous. I wish you would let me into the organization. I, I, I don't care if you the radio. I like that. <laughs> um, this is a question that was submitted in advance. Crime in the city is generally down, but hate crimes are up. What kind of steps? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeager. No, we want it here. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Okay. Um, under the, I'll be as quick as possible. Uh, under the city charter, the, the revenue that we have in the city budget is supported by the mayor. The city council can't, can't change the revenue. The city council can't change the expense side. What the city council needs to do is to hold the expense down, and the city council hasn't done that in the last four years because our budget has gone up to $86 billion, it's increased by 20%. So, and we haven't saved money for a rainy day. We haven't saved money for the what if situation. We haven't put that money into paying down our debt. We have to do that. And in the city council, I will do that together with what I call the common sense caucus, which is moderate Democrats, moderate conservative Democrats who believe that our government is moving too big, too fast, and we can do something about it by raising our voice again. Crime in the city is generally down, but hate crimes are up. What concrete steps will you be taking to deal with this pressing issue? Mr. Yeager. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah, so on that, what Mr. Yeager said is true. Uh, I think I was alluding to it before. A lone city council member is not able to say that, oh, no, they will, they will accomplish that. I think the idea is, and again, this is the thing, a city council member has to partner up with the other city council members, and this is where speaker comes in, this is where the mayor comes in, this is where on a macro level you need to be able to be confident that your city council member will develop the working relationships needed so that as a force we could uh, improve that situation. One city council member did, but no, we're not running for mayor, we're not running for governor, we're not running for president, we're not running for congress or senate. Uh, city council member by himself needs to just come together with others. I think you got the question already. 
I said the question twice already, but I have to repeat it. Yes. Crime in the city is generally down, but hate crimes are up. What kind of steps have you been taking to deal with this pressing issue, Mr. Diego? Well, hate crimes are up, and we, we deal with them in several different ways. First of all, hate crimes are about a classification of crimes that where somebody's attacked according to who they are. We are the victims of that more than, than any other. It's growing, and it's just factual that it's growing. The police department says they know it, uh, they're not disputing it. So it's twofold. Number one is enforcement when somebody's caught, where the district attorneys have to, they have to enforce hate crime statutes against people when they have evidence that a hate crime was committed. And the second part is within our police. The police have to be more sensitive to what it is that they're hearing from a complaint. Hey, he punched me in the face. Oh, he said you when he was doing it. That's the difference. That has to be noted by the cops who are taking down the report. And we have to make sure that our that hate crimes are actually being enforced properly. Yeah, I think uh, how you mentioned the question, uh, you know, that crime is down, but hate crimes is up. I think that truthfully, it's a very interesting situation that I would look, I think needs to be evaluated more of what is happening. People easily could say it's the Trump effect. I think that's very simplistic thinking. Uh, the bottom line is, as I've mentioned a number of times, to me, it's about community engagement, community togetherness. I've been so proud uh, to spend so much of my time on the radio talking about uh, the earthquake, the devastating, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, the devastating situation in Puerto Rico. Uh, it took time to uh, work and talk about with Muslim community, with the Chinese community about their issues. I think hate goes down when there's more togetherness. I want to really bring our community together that way. I think that's important for us as a Hasidic community to show that we care about all communities. I work in the Bronx. I work in Staten Island. I work all over this town. I've been attacked, tried to be around with these boys, and they are out with them But I've been around these neighborhoods, and it's very bad. And I hate hate crimes, but it's so easy to attack somebody and say they don't deserve you. We have to be very careful on hate crimes. I've been a victim of hate crimes many times as a kid, and I've seen it growing up, and I know that things common that something happens with your kid. Unacceptable. Show we're going to go after that. Show we're going to make a prosecution and the kind of that deserve worse. But we have to be careful before we charge anybody. We have to be very careful on these hate crimes, because we just want to do I work with many different communities. I work all around the town. Yeah, the next and I want to make sure to tell you that I will be representing this entire city of The next question. I will make it sure that we have formed all the members and staff. A member noticed one of its possible to have the ice skating rinks open with separate hours for boys and girls. Let's start with Mr. Yeager. The ice skating rinks. The ice skating rinks. It's something we can explore. But City, yeah, it's something we can explore, but it's not generally, the, the, as you know, the city has policies regarding, uh, regarding that. We've had some successes with regard to schools, and, but it's, it's very complicated. It's something that we have to look into. There's no question that our community shouldn't be left behind because we don't have access to something. So we have to work with the city to see if we can, if we can enable some kind of accommodation where there are separate houses. I uh, can't wait. Uh, this is something, one of the things I'm excited for most. I don't get how city the progressive agenda seems to exclude the ultra-Orthodox community. So, you know, I am so excited to actually uh, take advantage, at least let it be good for the following thing. If you're progressive and cultural sensitivity, then no, this should not be the, how the city operates. Cultural sensitive, sensitivity, I say, let's take advantage of that. If we have uh, four more years of this type of progressive New York City government, uh, City Hall, Let's take advantage of that and make sure that the Orthodox community is benefiting from all that cultural sensitivity. I grew up in a very serious Jewish family. I, I can't tell you about the separate ice game. Uh, right now they have dual backwards. You know, we have, we teaching our children gay and lesbians sexual education classes. You want to have separate ice skating rinks? Right now, let's stop the stupidity of, of teaching our children of, of sharing a bathroom with a man and a woman. That's the stuff that we should stop. That's the craziness. We should stop that stuff. These are the things that we have to look at. I, we have the why. We have so many different private organizations that we can use and help our community and support. You can free time if you want to have separate men and women. So we should have it that way to maybe get more community affairs in, more community activism in, to create our own separate. Okay, the next questions. 
What is your stance on the this is a state issue? What is your stance on the Child Victims Act, which has penalties for yeshivas but not for public schools? Uh, Mr. Yeager? What is your stance on the Child Victims Act? I think you said that the Marshal Bill, which has penalties for yeshivas but not public schools. I oppose it, and I'll tell you why I oppose it. I oppose it because I believe in statute of limitations they exist for a reason. Yes. And to reopen a statute of limitations for something that happened in the past, where it's not going against the individual who committed the crime, but it's actually going against the yeshiva and the moises, that would bankrupt the yeshiva, period. It has the potential to do so. And it's something that we have to be very, very, very vigilant about. We don't want our yeshiva bankrupt. We don't want our moises bankrupt. Now, if we were going to pass a bill that said, Moving forward in the future, there is no statute of limitations, or this is what the statute of limitations is. That's a different concern, and that's a different issue, and I would support that. If you go backwards in time and to lift the statute of limitations for civil penalties, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. For civil penalties against the yeshiva, I would disagree. However, for criminal penalties against the perpetrator, I'm there 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Children's souls have been destroyed. I think that we need to give value to this question in a more respectful way. We are running for city council, okay? I am not going to answer that, but I'll tell you why, because I know a thing or two about this, okay? Children's souls have been destroyed, okay? And we need to first take a step back before we get into, oh, we do support the market bill. Certainly, bankrupting the yeshiva, nobody wants to do. And of course, we would all say that there should be nothing that will that will be able to enable some 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 you know havoc situation where that would be you know where there's no accountability to what's going to happen to the yeshiva if we allow that. But no, one second. <laughs> but I think it's more important that we as a community do a little bit more to show that we get it first. I don't think we've done that enough, and I think until we do. We're not ready to answer such a question in such a simple way like that. I believe they should be punished right away. I believe the people who committed the crime should be punished forever. But you cannot assume 50 years later new administration and you cannot punish the little children. We have to be vigilant. I was one of the ones who created the fact that two rebbies or one kid should be in a room or two kids and one rebbe. You can never be alone with a child in a room. And we have to keep to this fact. A lot of these students are following this new policy and this is a great policy to protect our children and I'm going to be out here to watch that our children don't get sexually abused. Okay, we're wrapping up now. We're giving each Just candidate uh, one minute to take a few more to the order. We'll start with Mr. Yeager. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity, and again, thank you very much to Shaka and to uh, Amdia for setting this up. Uh, I, I have uh, made my case. Uh, we have eight more days uh, to, make my, to make our cases, me and my colleagues up on the stage. Um, I put myself in front of a community that I love, just like my colleagues love the community. Uh, we all do. But the question ultimately is who had the experience on day one to walk into City Hall and begin fighting for our community? Who understands the issues? Who can make a bill become a law? Who has a partner to do it? Who knows where things get done and how they get done? I'm asking for your vote. I'm asking you to trust me, obviously, because you can't take back your vote the next day. But I don't want you to have far off the back of your vote. I want you to believe that I can help you and walk with me for the next four years and we're going to get it done together. Thank you very much. I started off earlier tonight uh, and I said three things. Number one, let the official needs to be about two things, character and the ability to get things done. Number two, I said this is very serious. I want to bring those three points together. This is very serious. Whether it was the last question asked just now, or whether it was about the question asked about the uh, about taxes, uh, I don't see where he went, I'm sorry, but the point is, is that this is very serious. Know-how, character, and this is serious. 
I want to believe that when you look at me, you see someone that's going to give the seriousness of these issues what it deserves. That's going to work together with all of you to figure out how we could go about making things a little bit better. And very complicated things. This is our lives. The direction of Borough Park and Midwood will be decided in nine days, okay? And let's be honest over here, everyone. I've had to stay back from a lot of negative things that have been said about me. We are talking about a situation, and we're going to go back and forth, and I'm sorry, I apologize, I didn't even have a moment. But we, have, we can go back and forth, he said, she said, he said, she said, okay? We all know the facts here. Who has, a rec who has a record of caring for people, and who can you trust will really, really be there to work and figure out what could be done to help people. Most of the content over here has all been similar. Have you not noticed that? So this know-how, the content is basically a lot the same. Mr. Fishler, it's about, it's about being there for people, and I stand by that. Thank you very much. Fifty-four years old. That's what I am. I've served this community for forty years. I'm here for you. I've struggled. I've gone through the trials and tribulations of this community like you have to do. I'm not here to play games. I'm not here to be a career politician. I don't need the job for the next twenty years. I don't need the job at all. I want this job. I've showed this community. I've served as a person. I'm taking care of my neighbors, children, people in my home. For the next eight years, that's all I want. I know I can make a change. I know I can teach the next councilman how to do the job right and work with our new assemblymen. I'm going to make sure that this is a better city, a better community, better for our children. I'm not here for the long term. I'm here to make the changes, and I'm not picking out of the box. I know the problems that are in the box. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to attack them right away, and I'm here for you. You want to know who's experienced? Me. I struggled it. I know it. I work with the 312 government agencies. I know how to navigate the system. I know I don't know great legislation from my great lawyer friend over there. I have not experienced the journey meeting all the politicians, but I do have a staff. I do have competent people around me. I have many lawyers that I've hired, I've taught, I've shown, and I know the laws. I study the laws. I research the laws. I'm the best person on the record of the 7th University of the Haitian Tishler. And you're all welcome. Thank you to the candidates and thank you everybody for coming here tonight.